Good morning, everybody. My name is Jane Cleland Huang, and I'm a professor at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. It's my pleasure to be able to give this keynote at the 28th Asia Pacific Software Engineering Conference. So before I get going on my topic, which is on software engineering for human on the loop cyber physical systems, I want to show you where the University of Notre Dame is. You can see we have a beautiful campus here. Um, I wish that we still had the green leaves, but winter has already arrived, it seems. But here we have Taipei, which is where the virtual conference is. And we have to go the whole way around the other side of the world to Indiana, to Notre Dame campus. And that's where I'm giving my talk from now. So my talk today focuses on an emergent topic in software engineering that sits at the intersection of software engineering, human computer act interaction, and autonomy of cyber physical systems. So the focus of our work is inspired by the continual advances in AI and robotics, which have enabled an increased autonomy level in cyber physical systems. And our research really focuses on this area of, this emergent area of multi CPS systems with a focus particularly on UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. The UAVs have an increasingly um, complex and effective form of autonomy and they collaborate together as well as collaborating with humans. Because we have multiple UAVs, we have to establish what is known as a human on the loop system in which instead of the human controlling all of the interactions and all of the actions of the drone, the human supervises their tasks. Before I go into that, I want to give a call out to the many people, um, many of my team members, you can see many of them here. Um, I was thinking back actually for the last four years since we've been working on this project, and I think we've had about 40 to 50 different students and postdocs um, who have all worked um, on our dronology, originally called dronology, and now our drone response system. So um, thanks to them for all of their many contributions and also for making this project that's really fun um, to work on and to collaborate um, with. So the question I particularly want to address today is how can we as software engineers effectively address human interactions in these human on the loop systems? And I think to really answer that question, we have to take a look across the entire life cycle. So I'm not going to attempt to answer the entire question today, but I think the answer involves requirements engineering, um, which is an area that is very close to my heart and much of my um, prior work has been in the requirements engineering community, but it also impacts design, design of the user interfaces so that we support um, specific interactions of humans, but also architectural design so that it can support the actions that the users and the drones want to make. And then beyond that, the development test and maintenance of the system. I'm gonna address these questions through lessons that we've learned engineering our own drone response project. And I have used this slide um, as a call out to the fact that much of the work of this project has gone on during the COVID um, pandemic under less than ideal circumstances. Um, we've been affected with our physical supplies of drones by the supply chain problems that many people have experienced. So the work that I'm going to present today has been conducted um, in both simulation form and also with physical field tests. And I'm going to show you examples of both of them. But before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about my research story and provide a little bit of background about how the three real areas of research that my, my group has participated in or engaged in kind of all come together in this talk. So since my PhD, I've been interested in the area of software traceability. And I'm sure as many of you know, software traceability is all about establishing and maintaining and then using connections between software artifacts. So, um, establishing trace links, for example, between requirements and design and code and test and um, operating context and models and all sorts of things like that. So we've been um, invested over the last 20 plus years in automating this process. 
And for each of the three research areas I'm going to briefly mention now, I'm just going to call out a, um, a paper. This is one of our recent papers in this area where we um, leverage the advances in natural language processing, um, particularly the pre-trained BERT models and then models that we have um, fine-tuned ourselves to support traceability. And these advances in natural language processing in BERT and Roberta in particular have enabled us to um, establish or to generate trace links whilst taking advantage of the semantics behind the artifacts. So that's led to some real improvements and I'm briefly going to mention this at the end of my talk. The second area of research that I've engaged in and I'm particularly interested in is this idea of safety assurance. Um, because we focused on traceability, we've also explored this area of safety assurance in agile environments, which I understand is controversial. Um, but more and more companies are exploring um, the agile delivery of cyber physical systems. Cyber physical systems often have the potential for causing harm, creating hazardous conditions, and therefore um, need to be con we need to consider the safety aspects of them. So those are the kind of systems that we're interested in. And one of our recent papers that talks about a tool that we've developed um, appeared in IEEE software. And then finally, the third area, which is the main topic of my talk today, is on unmanned aerial vehicles for emergency response. And people often ask me, how, how did you get to drones, unmanned aerial vehicles? I'm just going to refer to them as drones because it's easier to say. Um, how did you get to drones from your research on software traceability and safety assurance? And the answer to that is really simple. As many of you probably have observed, as um, software engineering researchers, we are often, um, you know, we, we need data and we need environments in which to conduct our experiments. And as a result of that, it's become very popular for software engineers to do their research using open source projects. And we would have done that if we could have found the right kind of open source projects. But we were interested in projects that instead of just having um, feature requests and bug reports had the kind of artifacts that were present in more safety um, critical systems like requirements, design specifications, architectural drawings, diagrams, um, models, and all of the code and, and test cases as well. And furthermore, we wanted to have these across multiple versions of, our, of those systems. And we found it was impossible to find them um, even with our industrial collaborators, they didn't give us access to that much data. And so we decided to build our own system. Um, this is a system that we've been building over the last four or five years. Um, it's been developed um, with the help of PhD students, but also with um, professional developers um, to bring a kind of real life sense to it. And um, it's a system that we've built to support emergency response and deployed in the real world. And um, one of the papers that is representative of our work in this, in this area is a paper by Ankit Agrawal as the first um, author on the next generation of human drone partnerships um, that appeared in the CHI conference. So I'm now gonna focus on our drone project. And I should say that the drone project um, has a life of its own now. Uh, whereas we started it, um, as software engineers to build an environment in which we could support our software engineering research, we've since actually received funding for this project in its own right. So this project is funded by the National Science Foundation and now also by NASA in, um, in the US. So we're interested in applications of drones outside in the real world. Um, a lot of people that do drone research are in the robotics space and they're looking at kind of really, um, you know, hardcore robotics, but we're definitely more interested in the software and systems engineering aspects of these systems. And in particular, you can see drones can be used for things like outdoor athletic events, sporting events, um, delivery of here we have a pizza, but obviously medical supplies and emergency response in all its forms. And here you see a drone delivering a flotation device um, to people in a lake during a practice um, event. Drones can also be used for structural fire surveillance, 
And um, in this example, two of my undergraduate students for their term project, they built a mechanism for delivering a defibrillator device. They looked at one option that would drop the defibrillator by parachute, but they found the drone had to be really high for that to work. And so then they looked at this option and you can see the drone is going to drop the defibrillator by fishing line. Um, so these are the kinds of applications that we're interested, but built into a, a larger system. Finally, in terms of example of the kind of work we have done, um, this was a demonstration that we conducted with the South Bend Fire Department in our local town over the river. Um, and basically you can see drones flying around in the air. And these, this was our previous version of, drone, of um, dronology. So these drones did not have as much autonomy and intelligence as our current drones have. Um, so this was more like an enactment early on in our project. And we've been slightly grounded because of COVID um, since, but these drones, um, we demonstrate how the drones can be used to search for a victim in the river and then to work with the fire department as they go and actually um, rescue that person. So nowadays when drones are used um, in the US and um, throughout many countries, nations in the world, drones are already used actively for emergency response. In many of these applications, they're used as tools whereby you have a, a, an operator who is operating the drone um, in basically a human in the loop scenario. So it's basically flying the drone. And this was an example, um, many of you may have heard of the fire that occurred at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris um, a couple of years ago and how drones were used to give a bird's eye view and to provide information to the firefighters. But in our projects, we actually envision something more than that. And in this Mission Impossible kind of slide um, picture, you can see the firefighters and the drones are teaming together. And this is really the vision that we have. We envision um, multi-UAV, multi-drone, multi-humans, all collaborating on a team together. Um, participating, offering the skills and the things that they do well and um, engaging together in emergency response scenarios. And so in our drone response system environment, you can see that we have multiple humans interacting together, multiple drones interacting together, and then the interaction between the humans and the drones. On board each of these drones, which is um, represented by this red box, we have compute power and each of the drones has the capability to perform different tasks independently and in collaboration with other drones. Now, I'm not going to talk very much in this talk about the, um, the way we've set up our overall architecture, um, but basically on board each drone, we have a state machine. The drones transition from state to state according to the current state of the overall mission and things that they sense in the environment using their camera and other onboard sensors. Each of these states, um, some of the states are very simple and some of them have um, much more complex behavior. For example, searching um, obviously leverages the onboard computer vision and some decisions that the drone needs to make sometimes in collaboration with humans. These green boxes, represent um, drone to drone and then human to drone or drone to human um, collaboration points. But in our overall system, the drones are individually tasked with these tasks. Um, in this case, they have detected a person who's a victim in the river. Um, they send this information to the humans. Um, our architecture in the middle actually uses a, um, an MQTT broker, which is a published subscribe architecture. So an alert is raised. You can see here in the UI, um, in this mock-up, um, basically an alert, alert is raised and, um, if the human is needed to give some feedback about the um, sighting um, created by the drone. Overall then, the system, the drones interact with humans, um, human responders in the real world, who then would go out and um, actually conduct the physical rescue. 
And then, of course, we have to remember the other stakeholders that are part of the mission. For our case, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, has numerous regulations that we have to follow for flying drones in the um, U.S. airspace. And other stakeholders, for example, in river rescue, um, such as fire, um, such as the fishermen on the banks of the river. So this is a kind of overview of our overall system. So now I want to look at the human interaction. And I think human interactions can come in two, um, three different ways, actually. First of all, humans in the loop. So this is more traditional um, how humans interact with cyber physical systems. And in the example, many of the current uses of drones in today's emergency response really are represented as human on the loop, where the human is responsible for making the decisions and sending direct controls um, to the drones. And then on the right, we have this kind of on the loop system where the human, the, the drones act autonomously and the humans supervise the tasks and need to be aware of what's going on and make according decisions. And then I kind of came up with this term um, under the loop, but basically this just represents the fact that the operator and the operators are not the only stakeholders involved in using the system. There are numerous other stakeholders and you can see many different ones down at the bottom. Users of the system, um, hobbyists, people that are using drones to deliver devices um, for surveillance, um, public that get hurt by drones when things go wrong, um, just people maybe working at home in their gardens and the, um, a drone flies over the garden and the person really wants to um, have more privacy than that and um, so on. So we need to keep these people um, cons under consideration. And one of the models that I found particularly helpful from the requirements engineering perspective is something that we call the onion model, which was put together by Ian Alexander and Suzanne Robertson. And you can see that the system under development that we're focusing on is in the middle. And then you have these layers of the onion. And as you go out, um, you first of all have the um, direct um, stakeholders who are directly involved in the system. And then you have the people that are helped by it. And then you have the wider environment. And these may be regulatory groups, private citizens, and all of these things. So if we're really going to look at and understand the role of the human in a cyber physical system, I really want us to remember that it's not just the direct operators, that there are these other stakeholders that we have to um, take into, consider, into consideration and we have to envision um, what their interactions will be with the overall system. So therefore we started our project um, by engaging with our firefighters. I think it would have been a really huge mistake for us as software engineers, um, computer scientists, researchers, to just envision ourselves what we thought would be possible, build that system, and then just go and take it to the stakeholders and say, here, here's a new system, you can use it. So we actually invested quite a lot of time in talking with the firefighters, meeting with them down here. You can see this was the day we did our, our demo of the, of the drones. We wanted them to kind of really envision it in the real world and um, think about what it would actually be like. Um, and then we perform some kind of participatory design with them to engage them actually in the design process. So we had a lot to learn from our stakeholders. And I think this is really important for all software engineering researchers, no matter whether we're working with cyber physical systems or bu building tools um, for the open source community, we need to really listen to our stakeholders and find out what their needs are. We also took a scenario driven approach um, I'm not going to go into all these details, but we spent quite a bit of time um, writing use cases. And if you're interested in our use cases, you can see them at the, on this GitHub page. Um, each of our use cases um, linked to lower level use cases. Here, here's a lower level one where it kind of gets into a little bit more of the details of what the drone is going to do um, and also includes some of the information about the human interactions. So I think scenario-driven approach um, is really important in contextualizing 
you know, how are we going to design this system to support humans um, as they interact with the site with the cyber physical system? So we found four different forms of interaction, which are not rocket science, but I'm going to mention them anyway. Um, human to drone interactions where the human is defining mission goals, um, maybe sometimes giving specific directives to the goals, maybe some to the drones and maybe sometimes engaging in interactive decisions um, if the drone were to actually request help. And then in the opposite direction, the drone to human communication, um, the drone's going to constantly be providing its state, informing the user about what it's doing, um, sending imagery, event notifications, um, maybe even explaining its autonomous behavior, and sometimes requesting things of the humans. Um, just like the humans are going to request the drones to do things, the drones are sometimes going to have situations in which they're not sure what to do. Maybe they're, they have um, high levels of uncertainty or low confidence in what they found with their computer vision and they want the humans to give some feedback or help on the decision they need to make. Then we don't want to forget human to human collaboration. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in this talk, but um, one of my students has done a lot of work in this area of getting information from the drones like video streams and then using it for, hu for human to human decision making and, and shared tasks. And then finally, drone to drone collaboration. For example, if one drone were to detect a victim and wants to go into tracking mode to track the victim, maybe they're moving, they're in the ocean or something like that. Um, what if another drone has also detected the victim? Which one of them is the best in the best position? Um, you know, have they found the same victim? And um, if you want to choose one tracker, which drone out of all the drones should play this role. So the drones have to be able to collaborate together to make these kinds of collaborative decisions. Unfortunately, drone flying is not without its problems. These are some of our, um, these were our very earliest drones that we used to use the irises um, in the days when I used to collect pictures of our incidents. And you can see all sorts of um, problems that occurred. And obviously, if we're thinking of using drones for emergency response, we need to build them in a more robust way. We need to build systems that are fault tolerant, that can survive um, incidents and always um, kind of operate in a safe way. So incidents are caused by many different things. And in this talk, I'm particularly interested in the human aspects of these incidents and the interplay between the um, failures that drones might have, failures of the system itself, and then the role that humans need to play in um, remediating or um, in these incidents when they occur. So one of the papers that we wrote on this that appeared actually in ESEC FSC last year, um, we, we basically did an extensive study, and this was a work that was done in conjunction with Michael Bierhauser um, from Johannes Kepler University and some other members of my team. So we explored um, all sorts of different accounts of incidents, and we identified different kinds of hazards. So you can see here that um, we identified primarily these eight different types of hazards, the ones that are most common, um, collisions between drones and other drones, objects, the terrain, communication problems um, due to loss of, loss of signal, communication, um, hardware sensors, um, things that didn't work anymore like the cameras, LIDAR, etc. cetera, uh, mission awareness, which is more to do with where the human or the drone loses track of what's going on in the overall mission, um, mission planning problems, pre-flight configuration, which was a huge problem, as you'll see in a minute, um, many different problems with regulatory compliance, um, not following in, for example, in the US, the FAA's um, regulations about where you can fly, what time you can fly, under what conditions you can fly, and um, that kind of went into the weather. We separated these out because we felt they were different enough. After looking at all of these different errors, um, failure types, we categorize them also into these three 
cross-cutting themes. Now, one thing that it's really important to think about and to know is that often when there are incidents, um, accidents where people have lost lives um, that are related to cyber physical systems, there's often a post-mortem analysis. And the post-mortem analysis often comes back to blame the operator. And whereas there are many times when the operator makes mistakes, it's our responsibility as software engineers to build systems in which it is very difficult for humans to make mistakes. We want to make it as easy as possible for humans to do the right thing and as difficult as possible for humans to do the wrong things. So we identify these three different cross-cutting themes. Um, the first is human initiated errors. We labeled any kind of errors in which the humans deliberately did something wrong. Um, you know, maybe it's because they didn't have enough training, um, but for example, a human that deliberately flew a drone in a way that they were not allowed to by regulations, or they configured the drone in the wrong way. So these are the ones where I'm saying, yes, they're human initiated errors, but we still can build systems that will make it more difficult for the humans to um, do these things wrong. Many errors were due to loss of situational awareness. This is probably the most common thing. And then the other one that we identified is lack of empowerment. So these are cases in which the human knows something's gone wrong, but they really can't do anything about it. They have no, the system hasn't really empowered them to remediate these problems. And you can see um, for all of these hazards that um, real incidents that we identified, we kind of plotted them across the human initiated loss of situational awareness and lack of empowerment. And you can see the, um, the kind of numbers for each one of these. So unfortunately, human interaction hazards are very common and probably the, the cause of most incidents. So here was one incident that happened in 2015. It was a near collision between a UAV and a helicopter. And the UAV was flying at 700 feet, over 700 feet, even though actually in the US, we're only allowed to fly at a maximum altitude of 400 feet. The RPIC, which is the remote pilot in command, um, had actually set the return to launch um, altitude very high, around 750 feet, because he thought it would be a sensible way for the drone to return home if the fail safe kicked in. Um, unfortunately, it was illegal, um, even though he thought it would be a good idea because it would be able to avoid electrical pilots. So during the flight, the drone lost communication signal, the fail safe kicked in, the drone elevated or ascended to 750 feet, flew home, and um, almost flew into a helicopter, which luckily the helicopter pilot saw the drone and was able to avoid it. In this very terrifying incident, um, and this is obviously a reproduction of it, um, a, 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 a um, remote pilot flew his drone um, beyond visual line of sight, which is actually illegal. Um, he didn't have um, great skill in manually operating the drone, couldn't see the drone and the drone flew into a um, hot air balloon and actually its propellers broke off and ultimately the drone crashed. But I think you can only imagine the terror that the people in the balloon would, would feel to see it, it being attacked by a drone. So that's a second incident. And um, here's a third one. You can see during a skiing event that was being filmed by a drone, here's, oops, um, he is a poor athlete going down, trying to get his fastest time. And unfortunately, the drone crashed on him. And fortunately, just it crashed right behind him instead of on top of him or in front of him. So these are the kinds of things that we need to um, be building systems that are robust against these kinds of accidents. In our study, um, I mentioned that we identified these different hazard groups. And um, what we actually did for them is we went and studied um, all of the literature that we could find um, to look for different accounts of hazards that were related to humans. 
And then we also built quite a bit on our own experience. We've been flying drones for um, four to five years now. Um, and you saw the accidents that we've had, um, many additional accidents I didn't have pictures for. And so we added our own experience to identify these problems. And um, you can see that for each of these, um, we identified a specific different types of hazards. Um, so there's many of these. In this case, um, a UAV flies dangerously close to another object or collides with it. So this is to do with the terrain um, based or the collision types of hazards. And the gray squares here represent um, kind of functional failures. Um, so they're kind of functional hazards, system level hazards that definitely need to be addressed because if we address these ones, then there's less likelihood that the colored ones, which are the kind of human interaction hazards are going to actually emerge. So we have to take a multi-prong, robust approach to hazard analysis and hazard mitigation. And the idea in providing these kinds of hazard trees is that we learned, um, you know, we really explored the human interaction hazards and we have created a resource that we hope will be useful for other people working in this space. So for each of these human related hazards, um, we identified whether they were human initiated, situational awareness, lack of empowerment. And um, if you were to go to our website, you would see um, that for each of them, we've proposed an initial set of mitigations. So here, for example, the operator is unaware that the UAV is flying too close to the terrain. Um, this is FX1 here. And here are some potential solutions. Um, when a UAV is flying below a minimum threshold altitude, the system shall automatically display a warning message notifying the remote pilot. So we kind of look for reusable solutions that make it really hard for the user to be unaware or to make subsequent mistakes. Here's another example. Um, this one is about pre-flight configuration. Um, the example I gave you where the pilot had actually configured his return to launch um, altitude incorrectly is an example of incorrect pre-flight configuration. And you can see um, you know, other hazards here like lack of empowerment, where it's difficult for the user to check and configure multiple UAVs simultaneously. Um, human initiated errors. Um, the operator just places a drone, for example, under a tree prior to la launch. I mean, that's just a human error and um, it'd be nice if they didn't do that. And then these situational awareness um, errors. The user's unaware that the system's not configured correctly. So whereas we can't necessarily stop a user from configuring a system in the wrong way because they can go and use a third party software system to configure um, the system. We can certainly build systems that are going to check for pre-configuration errors and make sure that the user has done, done this correctly. And in the third and final example, um, this one really focuses on situational awareness. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about um, situational awareness. So situational awareness has been defined as the ability for users to fully perceive, understand, and make decisions in a current situation. And the person that's done most of the work in this area is Micah Ensley, and she has a really nice book on designing for situational awareness. So you can see that we have these different areas of perception, which is all about recognizing and monitoring the scenario, the situation, comprehension, which is where we can interpret what we see and synthesize understanding from it. And then projection is when we fully understand the implications of what is happening in the scene and project those into future decisions. Ensley also put together a number of situational awareness demons, which we found particularly helpful in our work for assessing the quality of the design to determine whether it is supportive of situational awareness or not. So I'm going to very quickly talk about um, these. So the first is attention tunneling. And this is when you design a system that makes it easy for a user um, to focus on a specific um, piece of information. 
So they get too much information and they can't handle it. And so they focus on one piece. Out of the loop syndrome is particularly relevant to autonomous systems. Um, and we found this ourselves, but the idea behind the out of the loop syndrome is that the greater the autonomy that a machine has, the more the user trusts it and the less the user pays attention to it. So it's really important to create um, systems and designs that draw the user in and keep their attention. We've definitely noticed this when we've been out flying multiple drones. Um, they're all in the air. Let's say we have three drones in the air. They're all doing their own thing. And at times we've noticed ourselves turning away, not even watching them, um, talking to each other, then realizing it's because we trusted that they were doing the right thing. But we, we can't do that because legally we need to keep our eye on our drones. And information overload is just, wow, too much information. The user can't possibly process all of this. This is a real challenge for us in our multi-user um, UAV system because we want to be able to handle situations in case something happens to all of the drones at the same time, or they all find something interesting that they want to draw to the attention of the user. Um, if we just blast it all onto the screen, the users aren't going to be able to understand what's happening. And then we also identified some new demons associated with socio-technical cyber-physical systems. So particularly relevant because there are many humans, many drones, all interacting at the same time. So the first one is misaligned interfaces. There's two different ways that we can operate our drones. We can operate them through their onboard um, autonomy, their onboard system. And we can also um, operate them through handheld radio controllers. So we had an incident, for example, we, we program our radio controllers so that if we press a certain um, switch, a certain switch, then the system concedes control to us. It's a safety thing. But we had a case where an operator um, press that switch or um, toggle that switch, took control and didn't realize that the throttle was fully in the downward position, which meant that the moment they took control of the drone, it dive bombed to the earth and crashed. So we call this misaligned interfaces. And we need to program for this and to bring awareness to the user. Enigmatic autonomy is when the user is unclear about the, what, the, what the drone or the robot is doing. Why did it behave that way? What kind of permissions does it currently have? And these are things that are really important in these kind of new um, multi-agent systems. I don't have time to go into all of our different solutions, um, but I'm going to just kind of give a very quick call out to, to two of them. The first is some work by Ankit Agrawal on the left here. Um, Ankit spent a lot of time doing user studies, um, designing solutions, um, both at the software engineering and the HCI level to support the users in having situational awareness. Um, we found that one of the things we have to do is prioritize the alerts. We can't show them everything. If too many things happen at the same time, we have to start prioritizing and allowing the user to request or pull additional information if they want to. Another project that NAFI has been working on, um, basically funded by our NASA grant, is looking at onboard health analytics. We can't expect the users to be constantly and entirely monitoring the system to know when things are going wrong. And the inbuilt alerts um, on most UAVs are insufficient. So we've been applying some deep learning approaches using um, LSTM and other um, deep learning approaches to monitor um, for common kinds of failures. In this case, um, the autoencoder is highlighting problems that have occurred in, in compass um, magnetic interference. We want to be able to raise these kind of alerts and mitigate and even offer mitigations um, to them when they, when they occur. We did engage our users in a participatory design process. Um, I'm not going to spend much time. I'll just highlight a couple of things, but I think this is really important. Um, it's not enough to just take some kind of hazard analysis, design solutions. We really need to work with our users and see, does this work for them? 
So we ran a participatory design process in which we had an executable prototype that we were using. Um, this was in the early days of COVID, so we really couldn't go outside and fly, and we ran these studies over the internet. Um, we enacted problem scenarios through the ser series of executable prototypes, and we asked the users, in this case firefighters, um, several questions that hit on different levels of situation aware awareness. We got some really interesting answers back, which I'm going to very quickly share with you. Um, this was an example of an early prototype. Um, they rejected this because they didn't like the idea. They wanted the video to be right over the map. They wanted to focus on one thing during a rescue and not have to be turning the head from one side to another. Um, we also found something interesting because the situational awareness demons talk about building systems that, that prevent attention tun attentional tunneling. And actually our firefighters loved attentional tunneling. They said, when we find a victim, we just don't care about anything else. So they embraced attentional tunneling. But we, as the software engineers, had a huge concern about Yes, we definitely want you to rescue your victim, but you can't just leave four or five drones flying unattended in the air. So that led to some discussions and we identified multiple roles. One role, which several people are engaged in, is the rescue. And then another role is someone whose primary responsibility is the operation and the supervision and the safety of the drone. So we had to start building new user interfaces to support these multiple roles. Um, we also, from our final question, the firefighters raised some really interesting questions. Um, they said, for example, the autonomous part is so new to us. How do we know that the drone's recognizing a person as opposed to first responders or fishermen on the banks of the river? And they asked questions like, why is the drone flying over there? So this led to a, a, a lot of subsequent software engineering, new requirements, new designs to really communicate autonomy, autonomous decisions of the drones to really improve situational awareness of the firefighters. This led to a number of broader questions that I'm not going to address fully now, but just mention them. The first one is, when you are engineering a system of this nature, some of the questions that you need to ask and answer are how much control do humans want or need? And the likelihood is it that this will change from mission to mission. So we have to provide um, variability and to provide our users with the kind of controls they need to make these decisions. Can humans trust drones as true partners? Um, how much do they want to trust the the, the drones in different situations. Secondly, how much and what kinds of autonomy should drones have? Um, should drones be aware of values? Um, this is really interesting because we're kind of imbuing them with some kind of intelligence. So are they just functional or are they driven by values and how do we integrate those values into them? And values of interest might be things to do with privacy um, or sometimes making decisions about what they're going to do that could increase the potential for actually saving a life. And then what does society want with respect to drone usage for emergency response? You know, where are the checks and the balances? So these are additional questions that we as software engineers need to really address. And they tell us that these kind of decisions go far beyond the traditional software engineering life cycle that we need to engage with sociologists, with um, lawyers, with um, people in town councils, with the general public to answer some of these questions um, as we're building and designing these systems. So just to wrap up this talk, I want to talk a little bit about how we connect these things together. On the left, you can see a very, very high level um, architecture of our drone response system. We have um, multiple drones. Each one of them has um, an onboard state machine. Each individual 
state in the state machine can range from very simple to very intelligent um, with capabilities, for example, based on computer vision and shared collaboration. We have this centralized MQTT message broker. Uh, we have multiple UIs to support different roles in the mission. And we basically have a microservice based architecture where the microservices provide um, different kinds of functionality. For example, when the user defines the mission, plans the mission, it gets sent to the mission configurator. The mission configurator um, performs safety checks using a more um, traditional formal methods approach. It takes the mission, it breaks it down into individual missions, which get published to individual drones to enact the mission. The coordination handler allows collaboration between drones and humans, and the state monitor monitors the state of the mission, um, and so on. So this is a very, very high level um, solution. Here you can see an example of um, the, the way we define the collaborations between humans and drones. And these kind of definitions basically um, sit in this coordination handler. They monitor the system for certain states when the states occur, which could be because individual drones have raised events, or it could be because individual drones have entered new states. Then the coordination handler is triggered and the coordination handler uses its own log logic to make decisions, for example, which drone is going to be the tracker, and it publishes new messages to tell drones that you're the tracker, here's your new task, or maybe to another drone, you're not the tracker, continue with the search. Finally, now that we have identified the hazards, we've come up with solutions for addressing them, we ultimately need to make a safety case to demonstrate that we've addressed these human interaction hazards in our system and our design. So to do that, we formulate a safety assurance case. And our preferred approach is using the goal structuring notation. And you can see that it consists of an, a structured argument composed of claims, strategies, evidence, and context and assumptions. So here you can see going back to these hazard um, trees, and we've identified this one hazard here, which is about the um, operator needing to be able to intervene. So the hazard is that the operator is unable to intervene when needed. So we're going to establish a claim, which we're going to write here in the form of a goal. The claim is the operator is empowered to intervene when needed. And the context of this, of course, is that the operator is responsible for supervising multiple autonomous UAVs. You can see that we create strategies. Our, our strategies are in the form of arguments. For example, we're going to argue that all necessary intervention points have been identified and protected according to best practices. And we're going to establish um, subclaims and then, and then strategies for achieving those subclaims. And then ultimately, at the lowest level, we're going to have a set of solutions. And these solutions are going to be drawn um, from the design of the system at both the user interface level and at the architectural level. And with that, I'm going to end my talk. Um, thank you for listening. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs>